like to welcome you to this evening's lecture on behalf of the Institute for Advanced Study. As many of you will be aware, the Institute for Advanced Study for over 20 years has been working to facilitate and encourage faculty research and creative activity. We do this a number of ways. We do it through a series of trans or interdisciplinary seminars. We do it by a named lectureship, the Brandon and Lecture. But most of all, we do it by inviting visiting fellows to any of Indiana University's eight campuses to interact, to consult, to collaborate with a faculty person. When we bring these people in, we ask the Institute actually asks only one thing of them. We ask that they give a public lecture so that their expertise can be spread to a wider constituency than those in the Institute for Advanced Study. And of course, it is that particular requirement that brings us for this lecture this evening. And I'd like to turn things over now to my colleague, Heidi Gelt, who will begin the evening and introduce our visiting fellow. Yeah. I have several mics to deal with. First of all, I want to thank Mary Ellen Brown and the Institute for Advanced Study um, for helping us move forward on the research that George Knox and I have been conducting together now for the past five years or more. Um, and before I go on and explain the nature of what I'm going to do for tonight, I wanted to thank uh, a number of people and funding sources in addition to the Institute for Advanced Study. First, I'd like to thank Ivona Hedden for all the help that she's given me, Beth Clark, my assistant, Richard Herendine, Linda Baden, Carol Dell, uh, for the work that they've done to help us get everything together. And uh, Mark Robinson is here recording this. And Eileen Fry, who has always been the best person to work with in the slide library and who I see is up there helping us with the slides tonight. So, Heartfelt thanks to all of you and also the faculty for coming to tonight's lecture. I'm really honored to see so many friends here. And I hope by, uh, I'm obviously a big Domenico Tiepolo fan, and I know some of you are, and I hope the rest of you will be by the time this evening is over. Uh, Professor Knox and I have been working on the New Testament cycle that Domenico Tiepolo created sometime after 1785. Uh, since our last adventure together, uh, which was an exhibition, and I'll go into that uh, um, in a little bit. And since that time, we've been exchanging through email and telephone calls and faxes, all kinds of inf information. George Knox has been working in Vancouver, and I've been working here uh, when I can. And it suddenly dawned us on us last year that it would be a great thing if we all the questions that we had, if we could get a bunch of scholars together to test our ideas and to exchange ideas because we saw Domenico's work having so many applications in so many directions. And so um, I said, what the heck, let's try it. And we were very, very fortunate in receiving funding from the Multidisciplinary Ventures and Seminars Fund, which is bringing a number of internal scholars together uh, the College Arts and Humanities Institute, which is enabling us to bring some external scholars here. The Avis and Robert uh, Burke Lecture Fund, which is bringing uh, one of our distinguished scholars. The International Programs also kicked in some funds. The Institute for Advanced Study, of course, has been the sponsor for our, our, my lead colleague here, Professor George Knox. Uh, but we also received funding um, from the Institute for the visit of Reiner Buda, who unfortunately had to delay his visit uh, owing to complications in Germany. Um, we also got some funding from research and graduate uh, activity. So I'm very, very grateful for all of this funding. Now tonight, what I'm going to do is give you the overall picture. Uh, I've always been sort of the more or less writing for the general reader. It's been my pleasure at working at the museum too. We know that our general audience is the, uh, what we call the basic undergraduate. 
I know we serve many, many people in many different ways, but we try to target our information for that general audience. And so I myself has always tried to write at that level and reach that level and convert people to my enthusiasm for certain subjects. So I'm just going to give you a quick overall about this incredible cycle you're about to see parts of. And then uh, I will take a break and I have to pull two slides out of our carousel up there and put them in the right spots so that Professor Knox can uh, share his wisdom with you. And he's going to tell you about some of the challenges and problems and issues that a cycle as complicated as the one we're going to go into uh, deals with. So to just give you, I know some of you know a little bit more than others, but just to uh, provide you with some background, I'm going to start with the first two slides. Okay, let's go back to and get started here. First of all, I want to locate you in a country and a city, and the location is Venice. Uh, the country is Italy, the location is Venice, and on the left, you're seeing a painting by Gian Battista Tiepolo done in the 1720s, probably. Uh, it's a detail of uh, Rachel and the Idols and Laban. Um, and it shows in the upper left hand corner probably a self portrait of John Battista Tiepolo and his wife, Cecilia Guardi, in the blue, and one of their children, probably not Domenico, uh, who was born in 1727. Uh, John Battista is obviously the greatest, most celebrated Venetian painter of the 18th century. One of his uh, crowning achievements is the fresco cycle in Würzburg where he filled ceilings that are bigger than this room uh, with dazzling array of figures and space. Uh, this is one of the uh, allegories uh, having to do with that uh, Würzburg cycle. And Domenico, by the way, went with him on this trip in 1753 and 4. Domenico, born in 1727, uh, and who died in 1804, had his own career. Uh, on the left, you see one of uh, uh, the 14 Stations of the Cross, the first such uh, devotional cycle to be produced in Venice. It was commissioned in 1740 when Domenico uh, was still a young man. Um, so this was his first great essay, and here you see Christ being nailed to the cross. Um, by the 1750s, he'd also made something of a specialty for himself, uh, painting these kinds of everyday genre figures and uh, particularly sensitive to uh, portraying them from behind, which is uh, one of his characteristic qualities. In 19, I think it was 96, I've even forgotten the year, uh, Udine, the city of Udine, which is north of Venice, and there you see it, and Venice is down here, um, and we're participating in the celebrations uh, for the bicentenary of John uh, Batista's death, I think it was, um, and they invited myself and George Knox to organize an exhibition of Domenico's drawings, because Domenico was always known uh, better known as a draftsman. It seemed like his own identity was carved out uh, more specifically there. And we organized this exhibition for Udine, and that's a picture. I didn't get to go to the opening, but I did finally make it to Udine, and that's Barry and me and uh, Giuseppe Bergamini uh, in the exhibition. And in that exhibition, uh, Professor Knox and I collaborated on the catalog and the exhibition. And it contained, among other things, uh, the drawings, the f large finished drawings that Domenico was best known for, and which he began to create uh, when he went into a uh, state that we call uh, semi-retirement, uh, starting in the 1780s. Uh, either the commissions that, for paintings that he uh, continued to do after his father's death, either they dried up or he was less interested. Regardless, he seemed to settle down in the family villa uh, and uh, concentrated on drawings and produced these large cycles um, 
uh, on the left you see the one of many scenes he did of satyrs and centaurs, and here's on the right you see one of the many drawings he did of daily life in Venice and the Veneto, some of which are dated 1791, so we know they come towards the end of his life. Um, he also did the 104 drawings of uh, the life and times of Puntinello, which ha did have a uh, cover drawing, cover sheet, which is in Kansas City, which I'm showing you here, uh, which was the way I got to know Domenico, because our museum purchased two from this dispersed series um, back in the 70s, and that's when I w had become curator and got very excited about those drawings, and my first exhibition uh, ever organized was on the Punchinello drawing. So I've kind of been working backwards. I was familiar with the uh, biblical drawings individually. He's also a wonderful draftsman of animals. And I, this sheet of moths was in the show, Moths and Butterflies, um, belongs to Udine. And it also had I think we put in about 15 of the large, what, what Bayan Shaw, the, the father of the studies of Domenico Tiepolo drawings, called the large uh, religious drawings. And these drawings were left behind in Domenico's studio on his death in 1804. And somewhat later, they were uh, put up for sale by his widow. They are untitled, unnumbered. There's no documentation for them. Um, and at, when we first started out, we didn't even know how many there were. They're the least studied of his drawings. On the left is an example that was in the show of the parting of Peter and Paul. Um, and on the right is uh, what we now have decided is the title page or the starting scene, the sacrifice of uh, Isaac after a great Titian painting, um, which is in the Salute now. So we had no... Uh, real information other than that we knew they were all roughly the same size, this large vertical individual sheets of paper that he turned vertically for the biblical series, everything else was horizontal, and that they tended to co cover what we thought were essentially primarily New Testament subjects, although when we saw the sacrifice of Isaac, or at first we thought, well, maybe he mixed old and new and gave up on the old and started with the new. We didn't know what the sequence was. And after five years of working, now 138 of these landed in the Louvre. Uh, it's the Recoy Faye. Mr. Faye bought them and gave them to the Louvre. And the remaining were scattered. And they're all over the place now. There are many still in Europe and about 20 in the Morgan Library. Chicago has some, the National Gallery, and so on. So there we were, putting them together, gathering images, and trying to figure out how they relate to texts. And one of the things I'd like to say right now, before I move forward, is that Professor Knox did a lot of what I call the heavy intellectual lifting and helping us identify the drawings and connecting them to texts. And then we started working together. And I carved out an interest for myself, which I've always had about Domenico from the start, which is what is he doing as a narrator? So that's what I want to talk about. And we discovered that what Domenico did was to create, uh, we've now identified 316 drawings that belong to this cycle. And we've decided that they're all basically New Testament or related subject matter, which tells the greater history of the church, starting with the life of Christ's grandparents, Joachim and Anna, with the characteristic scene here of Joachim being expelled from the temple on the left, and then uh, many scenes, another 20 or 30 or so. They, they break down into chapters, as we call them, of roughly 25 uh, to 30 drawings, sometimes more, sometimes less. Here's the virgin on her way to be married on the right. Uh, there are extensive drawings dealing with the flight into Egypt, one of Domenico's favorite subjects, and including the scene of the Holy Family returning from Egypt, and I think when we take it uh, up to the, uh, uh, including those drawings, I think we're up at 48 of, of those. And Domenico himself knew his own history. And I should add in here that among other things, besides culling all kinds of texts and reading the New Testament carefully, 
um, we've discovered that Domenico, in a sense, also rehearsed the history of Venetian imagery um, and particularly uh, his own and his father's contribution to that history. But I think Professor Knox will go into that in greater detail. He included the ordinary stories that we know, for example, just the scene of the Holy Family setting out, and then rare subjects, which he sometimes expanded over more than one sheet. And one of the rarest ones is the idols in Sotinen, the, the Egyptian city of Sotinen, uh, where in the first scene, they've all come crashing down. The Holy Family has finally arrived in Egypt. Um, they take refuge in this temple because they have no place to stay. And all the idols come crashing down. And then Aphrodosius, the leader of, the, of this city, comes with his army to investigate. And he falls down on his knees uh, to worship this great uh, presence. He clearly recognizes that this divinity is superior to the ones um, that belonged in his temple. So this is a se sequence of events here, which he does quite frequently. He shows the Holy Family, another rare story, which he played out over more pages than any artist we can think of, or we've ever identified, he tells this rare story of the Holy Family meeting these robbers. And there are legends that come from Germany and other sources that say that the robbers took the Holy Family home, and they washed them and gave them hospitality, and then the Holy Family set out again. And he's particularly, as you can see, he loves these scenes of exits and entrances. We have um, 21 drawings of the life of St. John the Baptist, which makes an incredible chapter, including this one of my favorites, which actually is in reverse here, I see, uh, of John the Baptist having the vision um, when the uh, message from God arrives. And then another very uh, much more common scene of John the Baptist uh, attacking Herod and Herodias and telling them they've lived in sin, which of course leads to his beheading. We have uh, more than 50, up to 50 drawings of Christ's ministry, beginning with his temptation um, and all the way up to the transfiguration alone, that's uh, roughly 50 drawings. And I, obviously, you're only getting a taste here. On the left is one of the, the uh, temptations where the devil is saying to Christ, you know, if you bow down and worship me, he shows all three temptations. Uh, if you, uh, I will give you dominion over all the kingdoms. And Christ, of course, uh, says, get thee behind me, Satan. And then this is a very interesting scene uh, set in 18th century, uh, in the 18th century Venetian world where Christ comes and calls St. Matthew. Uh, so there are scenes of the calling of the disciples, Christ preaching the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Christ preaching from the sea, both of which are in the Gospels. Christ in the centurion, which he tells over two sheets. Wonderful miracle scenes. This is Christ walking on water and saving Peter from drowning, one of my favorite drawings. Rare scenes such as this one of St. Peter finding the coin in the fish's mouth, which really doesn't have an extensive pictorial tradition, and certainly not in the way that Domenico draws it, which is just awesome. More common scenes, but actually he does two of these, and we've decided they fall in different places in the narrative. He shows two scenes of Christ uh, in the house of Simon. And of course, if you read the Gospels, and we have become, both of us, extensive rereaders and readers. I've broken the spines of two Bibles, and I have to buy another one for our seminar next week. Um, there are two Simons. One is Simon the Pharisee, and one is Simon the leper. And if you read the different accounts in the Gospels, what you realize is that when Christ has dinner with Simon the leper, which is after the transfiguration, it also connects, if you read uh, uh, the accounts in John, whatever, this comes right after the raising of Lazarus. And, uh, and actually, the, the, those texts, when read together, tell us that uh, in Simon the leper's um, dinner, they all gathered uh, to host 
Lazarus, who had just been resurrected, who seems to be the figure here. And all these people are just shocked and amazed. And this must be then Simon the leper, although he's presented pretty much in the tradition of Simon the Pharisee. And then these people come and question. And in both cases, there is a woman who wipes Christ's feet with her hair. Now, typically, that's one scene. But Domenico actually makes two different episodes out of it. Uh, once with Simon the Pharisee and once clearly with the uh, Simon the leper. And, and the timing, he, he uh, places this later episode uh, with these threatening looking soldiers and gives uh, uh, some idea that this is moving us closer to the time of Christ's passion. And the passion cycle he tells over uh, another close to 50 drawings when you take them all in total right up through the uh, Ascension, including two haunting scenes of Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. And both times, the angel is not present. It doesn't, it doesn't come. The standard iconography is that the angel is delivering uh, the cup of comfort. But that doesn't happen in these scenes. And he's going back uh, to older traditions where, and the texts which specify that Christ prayed three times and then found the disciples asleep and Domenico draws Christ confronting the disciples. It's, a, it's just an expanded meditation. And these scenes of Christ uh, begging to be released from what he knows is going to happen are, are haunting and moving. And his, uh, his attitude in each scene is different. Just showing you two examples of that. And then, of course, we have the scenes of Christ uh, being cr flat, uh, beaten, crowned, the ecce homo, and then ultimately this despoilation of Christ and his crucifixion, all of those scenes, the, pa the whole passion cycle. He also tells the story of St. Peter. And I'm making a point here that's leading to another chapter, which is he includes Peter in standard scenes uh, very often uh, in, in, uh, in the scenes where he, he's the standard presence, such as this scene of the Transfiguration, which comes much earlier, of course. And then he goes to the trouble. When he tells the story of the denial of Peter, he actually takes it a step further and tells this much rarer story that isn't as often shown of Peter's repentance after the cock has crowed. And he knows that he's denied Christ, just as Christ had predicted. And there's the cock crowing. And here's Peter in his grieving uh, repentant state now descending the stairs and by the way the ascent and descent up and down the these theatrical stairs is one of his uh, order organizing devices this happens to be closest in spirit but not identical to a composition that we know by Lorenzo Lotto and then he puts Peter in stories that are where he's never uh, seen traditionally here at the crucifixion itself. And he actually played the story of the crucifixion out in the traditional way and then in an untraditional way, which is very loose. And he, I think he thought about it later on. There's Mary and John the Evangelist, the standard characters that are always associated with the crucifixion. But here's Peter, clearly the same guy with his, uh, uh, his tonsured head, the little forelock, running away from the, running away from the crucifixion. So Peter, I'm, I'm leading up to a point here, which is that Peter is an extremely important character to Domenico. Um, and it's especially interesting because Venice, you know, their patron saint was St. Mark. If he had made St. Mark a big deal in this narrative, we wouldn't have been surprised. But to see St. Peter playing such an incredible role, that was remarkable. This is actually. Uh, the earlier scene, he shows St. Peter assigning the place that Judas left behind and appointing according to the divine inspiration, Matthias. And after that comes Pentecost. He shows St. Peter and he adds in it. Sometimes he puts in inscriptions. It's kind of like he really wants us to be very clear about what this story is about. Other times, most times, there's no inscription at all. But this lengthy inscription points out that this is St. Peter assuming the papal chair in Rome.
He tells the story of the death of Ananias and Zaphira. You know, these were these people who were going to give to the church and sold property, as many other people had, uh, to this emerging church. But then Peter knew that they held back some of the money and that they lied about it. And he publicly condemns them for it. And they both fall dead and uh, are then ultimately carried away and buried. So you have three scenes of that. And then we have, a tra oh, when we have the death and burial, here is this wonderful funeral scene uh, where Domenico goes out of his way to locate it in Rome with two of its most famous monuments, the Colosseum, which of course was <laughs> built after. Um, and then he adds all the, uh, the only time he ever does this, he adds this, uh, the papal tiara, all this emblematic and symbolic material. And it gives Peter, he shows him being crucified upside down, but then gives him this fabulous funeral. And here he is, his body being carried on the, on the bier past these uh, monuments in Rome. Um, and then he adds a number of stories, what I, we consider kind of transitional events. This is the stoning of St. Stephen, one of the early martyrs. And that kind of links us up to St. Paul's story because according to the Gospels, uh, Paul, the young Paul, was present because he had, early in his career he persecuted the Jews, uh, the Christians. And then, of course, Paul himself is converted, and he shows Paul kind of falling sideways off his horse, all having this vision of God. And there are little lightning bolts that come out of the sky. There's one, and there are others. This, there's another one. He makes these lightning bolts come down. And the horse, of course, is, it's very dramatic compared to, say, the Caravaggio, where uh, I remember a student called it an accident in the stable. Um, and so here's Paul falling sideways. And then uh, later we see uh, Paul escaping from Damascus, uh, down the walls of Damascus. Paul, this is a very rare subject, Paul uh, circumcising Timothy on the left, the, and then uh, there are two scenes of this, uh, uh, Paul and Silas being stoned. Uh, there are three scenes involving Eutychus falling out the window and Paul um, resurrecting the dead Eutychus. Um, this is Paul and Aquila. Um, Paul then goes uh, and makes tents together with Aquila for a while and his wife but he only tells, uh, shows the scene of, of Paul and Aquila. And then Paul bidding farewell um, in Ephesus to all, all of his disciples. Paul, um, oh, and the burning of the magical, I love this drawing, of the burning of the magical books. Um, and then Paul, of course, is at sea, caught in a storm at sea, and lands in Malta, and performs a number, a number of miracles there before he ultimately goes to Rome. And one of them is that he, he's making this fire, and, and he reaches in, and a serpent attaches itself to his hand, and he's bitten by this viper, but he doesn't die, and they all realize uh, it's a miracle, and then he heals people. And then ultimately, Paul lands in Rome. And um, this is a traditional scene where Peter and Paul, and it's, it's in many of the early uh, Byzantine cycles, Peter and Paul, this is in the National Gallery and was in our show. And it's one of the most touching drawings of the two old uh, disciples <coughs> bidding farewell to each other. Um, they supposedly were executed on the same day. Um, and there's the, the platform getting ready for Paul's beheading, and unlike uh, Peter's execution, Paul he doesn't show the actual beheading, and he takes the uh, kind of light motif of Paul falling off his horse, and he shows his body already beheaded, being lowered to the ground. But unlike Peter, there's no funeral; at least there one doesn't survive, and certainly there's none of this uh, papal uh, emblemata, none of the extra accoutrement, uh, not even a martyr's palm being offered. So uh, Paul's story is a little bit more quotidian and more about adventures and less about the official acts and, and um, uh, so on that P 
Peter's story involves. And now um, there's also an epilogue. Um, and we're, we haven't quite figured out all the epilogue. There are scenes of later saints and their visions. For example, this beautiful drawing of a uh, vision of St. Philip Neri. And there are a number of other kind of miraculous. A lot of them have to do with masses. And what I thought I'd do now is just kind of run through a few of the elements that struck me as I began to understand this cycle a little bit better. Um, the kinds of things that Domenico did to expand um, what were rather compact um, stories into these expanded chapters and what that meant in terms of uh, his uh, experimentation with serial narrative because this really is an with 316 drawings, we're not aware of any other artist, single artist, who meditated at such length, used so many texts and so many traditions to, to create such a single, long meditation uh, on, on sacred narrative. And one thing he did would he'd take a standard subject like the expulsion of Joachim, and he'd expand it into two scenes, and they would be a fluid sequel. And many of them would have embedded in them his understanding of great earlier models like Durer and Giotto. Um, here's uh, Joachim being stopped by Rubens saying, and there's always dialogue. You can almost hear them screaming the dialogue. It's like theater. Um, you know, you, you have no right to come in here. You have got no seed of Israel. And then he, Reuben has turned away and is going into the inner sanctum. Now, in those few seconds later, Joachim is turned around. He's moving back with um, his shepherds uh, and their offering. And now, uh, this man has been joined by a friend. And he's pointing to Joachim's disgrace. And just in case we would miss it, he lines all these forms up, too. So it's ec uh, entrance, exit, uh, time passing. And the repetition, let me go backwards one, of a, a figure here. Um, one of the uh, patriarchs is looking at Joachim's disgrace. Now Joachim is present in that spot. He's moving the story forward. And he's saying goodbye to Anna. And what you'll notice is here Joachim's face is hidden. Most of the time, we'll actually see Joachim seen from the back, a kind of earthbound Anna, who's going to be the future mother of Mary, and then who in turn is the mother of, of, of Jesus. She's more elevated. We tend to see her face. So he consistently characterizes these people, which blew my mind when I began to realize it. Because it kind of begins to look arbitrary. And with his trembling hand, you kind of, and knowing that he kind of repeats motifs, you're sort of thinking, oh, yeah, he's just stitching this together. Oh, no. He's really thinking about what each one of these characters represent. Joachim is then visited by the angel. They both are, actually, when he's out in the desert. He can't really see the angel. I love the way he does this. First of all, he's, again, more earthbound. He's still on the ground. He's it's anecdotal. He's rubbing the sleep from his eyes. His angel's really got to do a lot of work to wake him up. You know, Joachim's kind of like his dog here, absorbed in, in the life here. But he also doesn't see the angel. Anna. does see the angel. And her angel comes in a cloud of glory. And it's a beautiful, elegant angel. And Joachim's angel is shouting. Her angel is very quiet and very gentlemanly delivering the message to her. And she takes this pose where she's sort of half falling on her knees. She's also been lamenting the fact that even the sparrows, this all comes from apocryphal texts, can have children. And why can't she? And then this angel comes down in this garden with a doorway, by the way. That's another element of his narrative, and is telling her that she will be the mother, uh, a, a very important mother. But look how elegant this angel is and how much more quiet this exchange is and more dignified. And then once Anna gets the angels, they're always with her. And they come with her back to the temple uh, at the Golden Gate, which he, we believe, combines with the uh, temple itself, which is, turns out maybe more historically correct. 
and he shows what, what may be two scenes of the same reunion. It could be two different places, but um, in one, she's about to dismount. I love it because she's getting off on this little stool, and I've only found one other. Giovanni da John, Don Giovanni, a, a, a Florentine painter, does this with the Holy Family where the Virgin gets off on a stool, but it's not a common device. So she's being carefully ushered off of her donkey. Joachim has already arrived with his horse. They never hug the way they're typically shown in the tradition, and that actually has meaning, has to do with chastity. This angel who you'll recognize um, um, appears every now and again to give instructions, and he's kind of saying, hurry up, you've got to go up the stairs. So they head up the stairs, which I love. And again, you don't see Joachim, and you do see Anna, and this big cloud of glory. And the one angel's kind of checking back to see if she's making it OK. And she's very gingerly going up the steps. And the other angel's pointing up to the temple and the tassels and to heaven. And then they get into the Holy of Holies. And another distinction, as the smoke still obscures the altar, Joachim, one of the rare cases where he, he's looking up. And they're both sort of praying, uh, again, accompanied by the angels. And this, by the way, is a motif that becomes important later on. But when the ark reveals itself, Joachim is prostrate. Anna, in a pose which Christ is the only figure in the New Testament si section of it who adopts this pose when he's praying. So he inherits it from his grandmother. She has the ability and the uh, capacity and the uh, right, evidently, by her spiritual uh, rank to stare right at the Holy of Holies with the angels there hovering over her. And then they come home. He adds that story with the angel very protectively, you know, escorting her, floating in the air here, holding her. Uh, on the donkey, and they head home, and Joachim has joined them, and he's pointing to her. So he's in that location again, pointing to her, saying, you know, jubilant and triumphant at the source of his vindication, that they had the right to go into the temple and were vindicated. Domenico tells uh, in the marriage story very common and traditional stories, such as this one of the betrothal of the virgin. He also adds the marriage. and. Joseph is here kind of pop-eyed with amazement when the dove lands on his staff instead of any of these others. And the priest is saying, aha, he's been chosen you know, by God. And here's the cloud. And then these re much more unusual subjects um, and wonderful ones um, where Joseph has taken Mary home now. And he tells her in this scene you know, that he has to go away on it for six months. This comes out of an apocryphal story. Um, he has a carpenter's job he has to do. When he comes back, the virgin, in a gesture not unlike what Anna did earlier, reveals herself. Um, by the way, there's this little cat sitting here curled up, and the cat's a symbol for kind of wily behavior sometime. And anyway, here's the virgin saying, but Joseph, I'm pregnant. And he's going, oh my god, and he's running away. Very much like Joachim did, ironically enough, but Joachim did it when he didn't have a child. He's horrified when he has one. And he even leaves his staff behind. And then Domenico clearly tells us, but she is impregnable. He leaves this ladder up to this barred window to kind of make the point that, guys, nothing could have happened here, you know? Domenico uses certain devices to, uh, um, very specifically. This is Anna when she sets out. You know, she's gotten the angelic messenger, and the texts tell us that two messengers, i.e., two angels, escorted her uh, to the uh, temple to meet Joachim. And she has this little bower of seraphim, too, which is so sweet and makes it very endearing. Well, after Mary tells Joseph that she's pregnant, then they go off to the visitation, which sometimes, according to legend, Mary does alone. Sometimes she goes with Joseph. In this case, she's going with Joseph. But here are the angelic escorts again. 
And here's that bower of angels again. So again, it's indicating, and there's no baby yet, so it's clearly Domenico inserting this scene of them heading out uh, on the visitation. And here's this angel pointing to Mary and talking to Joseph, who, by the way, is not having much to do with her right now, and saying, listen, guy, you know, straightening him out. And then later on in the story, you see their relationship change. That's how subtle his narrative gets. Domenico also uses certain kinds of um, ways to present the Virgin, particularly in this shrouded kind of silhouetted form, which looks ominous and somber. Um, and one of the first times we see her that way is when Joseph, after they've been married, uh, has her enter that door, you know, where later on he then uh, tells, uh, discovers that she's pregnant after he's gone for six months. And you see the Virgin not joyfully entering this, this spot, and it, it, there's something somber about it, and it sort of implies the trials she's going to have. What Domenico doesn't show, or at least that doesn't survive, that we know about, there's no Annunciation. Uh, but he certainly, we know enough about the story to know that she knows that she's going to be with child. And depending on which legend you read, that's already happened. She's already conceived the Christ child before she's married. Then, in the circumcision of Christ, again, he uses this silhouetted form. And this is traditionally, in the, in the traditional interpretation of this scene, uh, it's the, considered the first shedding of Christ's blood. So again, there's something ominous uh, and the, the foretelling of uh, sacrifice involved here. And again, when Mary then uh, is presented in scenes of Christ's passion and death, there she is again in the, in the same form. This is a very unusual way of presenting Christ being carried to his tomb, by the way. His whole front part of his body is covered with a cloth. And he, as I say, he goes into very wonderful, these wonderful details. For example, here Joseph, as they're setting out on the flight into Egypt, he's very solicitous of Mary. And in the various scenes that he draws, he pays attention to what kind of relationship they have. And then on their first rest, um, it seems as though Domenico goes out of his way to create this really tender, homey scene. Joseph is holding the Christ child. The Christ child is kissing his cheek. This angel is kissing the virgin's feet. She's pointing to Joseph saying, won't you take some refreshment, dear, as the basket is being held by the angel. So it's this wonderful, tender uh, scene of affection. So he really does uh, work through different stages in a sense of their relationship. Another thing that Domenico does that really struck me is that when he tells certain stories, he uses motifs that he'll use again in an ironic way um, in a later part of the story. And here he's showing one of the two scenes he created of Christ raising the son of the widow of Nain. And part of the story is that the, the widow's son was restored to the mother. That's what the text tells us. And there's Christ pointing to the restored, uh, the, the um, revived child now being embraced by his mother. And notice this architectural setting which took place, according to the Gospels, in a gate. When Domenico does Christ's passion, he does it twice. Once is a sort of sequential narrative involving all of the different stages of Christ's passion. And then I think in commemoration of the fact that he knew he was the first Venetian to do the 14 stations of the cross, he actually does the stations, again, as a separate chapter, and both are Im embedded with references back to the overall um, narrative. And here, when Christ falls for the first time in Station 3, the setting is exactly the same. Now, both have their common origins in